that's as nerve-wracking for you as it is for me. Whew. Hello. Have you ever taken a moment to think about the labels that we apply to people every single day? We all do it. It's human nature. But the labels that we use and the way that we use them actually makes a massive impact when it comes to deciding what people may or may not be capable of. Now, I want you all to do me a favour. Can I get you all to close your eyes for me? Just for a moment, no falling asleep. Can you picture in your mind the image of a CEO or a business owner for me? How did you go? I mean, it's probably pretty easy, right? Okay. How many of you would have pictured somebody that looked like this? <laughs> okay. Can I have a show of hands as to how many of you might have pictured someone that looked a little bit more like this? All right. How many of you would have pictured somebody that looked more like this? Thanks for being honest. I think it's pretty fair to say that in the business community and certainly at the pointy end of the corporate food chain, Disabled people are largely absent from the picture. A few years ago, I was um, asked to come and be part of the employment space for disabled people, and I was super excited. It was a really shiny new project, and it was a chance to make some really meaningful change, particularly for people who had significant uh, disabilities. So you can imagine my surprise when a very well-respected colleague said to me, and I quote, Easy tiger. What you're going to get from this are some amazing feel-good stories. But you will not be able to develop sustainable, solid businesses. They're just too disabled. You can imagine my fury. I was so angry. I'm talking steam coming out of my ears, stomping my feet kind of fury. I was so angry that I was actually rendered speechless, which, as my gorgeous husband will tell you, is quite the rare occurrence indeed. <laughs> and me being me, the second thing that went through my mind was, oh yeah? Challenge bloody accepted. Because as infuriating as that conversation was, it actually forced me to consider in much greater detail the kind of barriers to economic inclusion that disabled people face every single day. And it also forced me to examine the kind of unconscious bias that we as a society actually have towards disabled people. We just don't tend to associate disabled folk with employment or business opportunity in the same way that we do non-disabled folk. In fact, right now, in 2022, there are disabled people who will wake up on Monday morning and go to work for as little as $2 an hour. Now, to put that into context, here in Australia, the minimum wage for adults is actually $20.33 per hour. So right now, in 2022, there are disabled folk who will wake up on Monday morning and go to work for 10% of the minimum wage. As a nation, we still support and fund sheltered workshop models of employment. And I'm really sorry, <laughs> but it is past time that we did better. Now, I do need to acknowledge that you know, those low expectations have a massive impact. We are conditioned as a society to question the capability of disabled folk. We don't, as a general rule, tend to see them as business owners or leading corporations or in positions of power or as key decision makers. Now, what we tend to see is that disabled folk are still fantastic fodder for what the late Stella Young used to call inspiration porn. You see it constantly in film and social media and television. I can guarantee that a lot of you will have had come through your newsfeed the video 
of the young person who, or the athlete, sorry, who takes the young girl with Down syndrome to the school ball. I know that more than one of you will have seen the image of a person with a physical disability working out with a no excuses caption underneath. It's the kind of image that portrays disabled people as one-dimensional human beings that really only exist to warm the hearts and open the minds of non-disabled folk. It is not exactly the kind of messaging that's going to convince you to invest in us, now is it? I do actually need to take a moment to acknowledge that not every disabled person actually wants to run their own small business. Some of us want to work for you. But I need you all to promise not to time me because clock watching is not my strong suit. It is no secret that disabled folk face underemployment and unemployment rates that are more than double that of our non-disabled peers. And this persists despite the investment of millions upon millions of dollars into research and systems that are designed to provide opportunities for us. It persists even in times of extreme skill shortages across many, many areas of industry. So why is that? Now, I've noticed that for some employers, the problem is actually fear. And the way my brain works is it likes to categorise that into two different types. Firstly, there's what I like to call cultural fear. It's the idea that, you know, maybe you're not quite sure how to work with us and talk with us. Maybe you're not sure how to act. Maybe you might do something that's a bit inappropriate. Can I just tell you <laughs> that last one? Or oh, It cracks me up every single time because I have to tell you that my disabled friends are quite frankly some of the most inappropriate people that I know. And that's saying a lot. <laughs> there seems to be this pervading fear that we might not be a good fit for your organisation. Maybe we'll be a little bit disruptive. You know what, maybe we will. But we need to see disruption as more than a purely negative thing. Think about all of the great social changes that have come about through disruption. Things like the Me Too movement, marriage equality, women's voting rights, although some politicians might like to repeal that. What about that smartphone in your pocket? What I think is actually missing from the knowledge base of many employers is that, statistically speaking, disabled folk tend to take fewer days off of work. We stay in jobs far longer than our non-disabled peers. When we're in the right role, we perform just as well as anybody else. Statistically speaking, we are very good for business. There's also what I like to call the economic fear. Some employers hold the belief that working alongside us or collaborating with us actually comes with a higher price tag. Maybe we need some special equipment. Maybe we need a wider door or a ramp. Maybe we need some adjustments to that open plan office idea. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we all need some adjustments to that open plan office idea. <sighs> Now, while some of these changes may be necessary, and it's absolutely true that they could come at a cost, what's not widely known is that in many areas of the world, the funding actually exists to help organisations mitigate those costs. But even if there isn't, what it's important to remember is that accessibility for the disabled community actually means better accessibility for everyone. It will help build your customer base. <laughs> Accessibility for us means better accessibility for pram users. Accessibility for us means better accessibility for the frail or the aged. Accessibility for us means better accessibility for the CEO who injures his knee at the weekly golf game. <laughs> now, one of the things that I learned along this journey is that those barriers actually don't start the minute we reach the age of employment. It starts very young, childhood. 
What I've learned is that disabled kids and their families actually don't often get to be part of what I like to call these big dream conversations. You know, the ones that usually start off with, and what do you want to be when you grow up? And this was absolutely Tia's experience. When Tia was growing up and transitioning through school and moving into adulthood, she and her family were actually presented with this preconceived pathway into a lifetime of very limited employment opportunities in a field that she actually had no interest in. Now, if you're like me and lucky enough to know Tia, you know that the only labels that matter are diva, international model, and fashion designer. Tia's business in fashion design actually kicked off in 2017 with exactly those big dream conversations that helped her to work out who she was, where her passions lie, and where her determination could take her. And this year, it took her all the way to New York Fashion Week. I get a bit excited about that. <laughs> and her designs appeared on a runway that was live streamed right around the world. Now, those big dream conversations. It's not enough to take those ideas, walk away with them, package them up, and come back and present them to someone. First and foremost, the disabled person needs to be involved in every step of this journey. I'm talking market research, product development, marketing and finance, everything. <clears throat> it can take some time to achieve that, but guess what? That's okay. It could take some time for that individual to actually learn how to dream big. And that's okay too. It could actually take some time for the people who are surrounding and supporting that person to learn how they communicate first. More decades than I care to admit when I was a very junior staff member, I was very lucky to be exposed to a theory of communication that was called the language of one. It's the idea that every single person can communicate, everyone. But they might be the only person in the world who actually speaks that language, and it's up to the rest of us to learn it. But once you've learnt it, the next thing you need to learn how to do is listen. And I mean really listen, to dig down deep into the heart of their dreams and find out what it is they want to do. Explore the workarounds to the barriers real or perceived, because anything less than that has the potential to be beautiful and shiny on the outside. You know those feel-good stories. But it will completely lack substance, or it might be completely reliant on external funding to succeed. It takes work, and there needs to be an appetite for that work. But the places you'll go when you do, <laughs> Now, I would love to introduce you to my very good friend, Kyle. Kyle is a young man with an intellectual disability who, time after time, was deemed by his former employer to be absolutely perfect when it came to upskilling and training new recruits, but was continuously passed over for promotion in favour of those same new recruits. He was missing out on stable employment opportunities because of this weird misconception that he wouldn't be up to the task. My friend Kyle has the most amazing people skills. He loves customer service. He makes a mean, dirty chai. <laughs> now, his big dream has always been to own his own coffee cart and to build the kind of financial stability that will support him and the family that he hopes to have one day. And guess what? With support to help make decisions and decide the direction of his business, over the past four years, he has built exactly that. He has a solid business offering. He's busy most days of the week. And if you'd like to book him, you need to be prepared to do so well in advance. Again, I'm not naive enough to stand here on stage and profess to you that this is all easy. It takes a hefty dose of hard work. And sometimes it takes a village, but is that really any different to anybody else that's tried to get a new business venture up and running? What I think is really important for that person and their village 
on their journey to consider is how are we gonna define what success looks like to us? I think one of my favorite, favorite things that has come from this pandemic is that so many of us are choosing to reconsider and redefine what success actually looks like to us. No need to adjust your hearing aids. I actually did say favorite and pandemic in the same sentence. We are looking for a silver lining here. Over the past two years, so many of us have looked at the trajectory that our lives are taking and gone, yeah, no, we're good, thanks. These days we want more. It's not just about the bank balance, although that definitely helps. We're looking for satisfaction. We're looking for connection and we're looking for joy. And disabled people are looking for the opportunity to be included and to showcase our value to the world. Because unfortunately, we haven't quite reached that point in our evolution where we no longer ask, and what do you do when we meet somebody for the very first time? Harry here is a fantastic example of how a business can be bring so much more <laughs> than an income. His business actually started out as a leap of faith. It was an exploration and just what it is he wanted to do one day. And over time, he's been able to build a steady stream of happy corporate and personal customers. It's hard not to be with a delivery of lollies and chocolate. What's not so easily quantifiable, though, is the way that Harry has used his business to connect with his wider community. He's built an amazing group of friends, and they love to sit around the table with him and help with the sorting and the packing and the taste testing. Harry's been back to his old school and he showcased his achievements to the school community and the ripple effect, I have to tell you, has been absolutely incredible. We are seeing huge spikes in the numbers of people who are investigating this as a viable alternative for the very first time. I realise that by now some of you are sitting out there thinking, OK, I get it, but what's it actually going to take? Well. <laughs> I've come to realise that I don't have all of the answers because if I did, I would be much wealthier than I am today. However, I do know this. I know that it takes belief and a willingness to take a risk from both sides. I know that we need employers to move past ticker box recruitment processes that miss out on the richness and the diversity and the skills that we can bring to the table. I know that we need investment from government that is more than just the cheapest available alternative. We want to work alongside you to build robust systems if we're ever going to have that economic impact that we're seeking. I know that we need those big dream conversations to happen and they have to happen early and often. And they have to happen together. Because the kids that grow up with us and work alongside us, who learn the value of a truly inclusive society, they're going to be the ones who are our future investors and employers and employees. I've banged on about labels quite a bit today, so I think it's really only fair that I share some of mine. I'm a mum, I'm a wife and a daughter. I'm a mad chicken lady. In my professional career, I'm a project manager. I am a board director. I'm a community volunteer, and today I'm a TEDx speaker. Now, I've got a few more. <laughs> Chronic health condition, clinical depression, anxiety, ADHD, Autistic. Now, I'm normally very out and proud about those labels. In our house, we'd have our own pride parade if we could. But I'm also a realist. I, even though these labels are a fundamental part of who I am, I know that they're also exactly the kind of labels that tend to make employers more than a little bit nervous. 
But I hope today has gone some way to changing that because representation really matters. We can't be what we can't see. I also know that some of you will may be struggling with the f fact that I've used the term disabled people. It's identity first language that I'm choosing to use for myself. It's also a small part that I can play to support my community to reclaim the power behind a word that historically has been used as a weapon against us. But it is my choice. So, the next time we meet, and I ask you to close your eyes and picture the image of a CEO or a business owner for me, apart from thinking I'm a bit odd, I hope that the mixture has changed from something like this to something that looks a lot more like this. And I know that despite the fact you, that you may still have some nagging little voices in the back of your mind that will be saying something like, what if it doesn't work out? What if they can't do the job? What, am I, what if they make a mistake and that business fails? that there will be a much louder, much more persistent voice that is asking a very different question. What can I do to make this big dream succeed? Challenge bloody delivered. <laughs>